Hola, muy buenas y bienvenidos a otro vídeo de Gear para Dummies. Este vídeo eh, es un vídeo que llevo mucho tiempo queriendo hacer. Eh, es el primer vídeo, de hecho, que en la que traigo un invitado al canal, lo cual tiene sus ventajas, sus inconvenientes, que luego pasaré a, re a referir. Este vídeo tiene bastante que ver con un proyecto de recreación que estoy llevando con otras personas. Eh, no es el proyecto de los marines, ese está ya casi acabado y este año se verán los frutos, espero, de ese, por fin, de ese proyecto de la manera más limitada que al principio, pero bueno, la vida es como es. Y eh, es, eh, una, es un invitado, básicamente es un veterano de la guerra de Vietnam, de las unidades de guerra clandestina en Laos y Camboya entre los años 1964 y 1972. El, este hombre, el nombre John Stryker Mayer, es un, bueno, es un buen boina verde de Vietnam, se alistó en el ejército en 1966, eh, fue destinado, hizo su paso por su entrenamiento básico, entró en operaciones especiales, en boinas verdes, pasó todos los cursos de selección, y fue enviado a Vietnam en 1968 a tiempo, poco más o menos, llegó, llegó a Vietnam en lo que, era, en lo que fue digamos, los momentos posteriores a la ofensiva del TEC, quizás el momento más crudo de toda la guerra. Y eh, bueno, formó parte pues, de una unidad que, eh, cuyas misiones eh, no se empezaron a, a ser públicas. Hasta, o sea, lo que es la existencia propia de la unidad no se empezó a hacer pública hasta 1995. Y no apareció la primera documentación escrita por los propios miembros hasta primeros 2000. En este caso, esta persona escribió su primer libro, eh, Across the Fence, que es eh, más allá, de, del, más allá de, de la verja, más allá de la valla. En 2003 lanzó el primer vídeo, después lanzó una segunda parte, aparte de que lanzó una edición extendida de este, de este mismo libro, nació una, eh, hizo una segunda parte unos años más tarde, se llamaba Underground, que era básicamente ya su segundo tour. Él, él estuvo dos veces, dos tours de combate en Vietnam de un año. Y eh, cada uno de estos libros cubre un, uno de cada uno de sus tours. Voy a poner todos los enlaces, tanto de la página de este señor como de eh, todos los libros que ha escrito y demás, en fin, libros que con suerte veremos traducidos y esto es algo que, que bueno, lo vais a ver en el vídeo, esto es algo que son de esas cosas que yo digo, si quieres que algo sea bien, hazlo tú mismo, así que quizás sea un proyecto vital bastante interesante. Y en, en este caso, pues, es una entrevista para que nos cuente un poco la lógica detrás de todo lo que ellos hicieron, cómo lo hicieron y qué llevaron durante la guerra de Vietnam, porque esta unidad, digamos, que ha sentado las bases de todas las unidades de operaciones especiales, de operaciones de contrainsurgencia en los años posteriores. Tener en cuenta que este hombre estuvo en la guerra a la vez, por ejemplo, que digamos el otro gran ejemplo de contrainsurgencia histórico que ya cité en el vídeo de Airsoft Histórico en África, que es eh, los Elus Scouts y el SAS de Rhodesia, digamos que es contemporáneo de esta gente. Y ahí es donde se cuecen, digamos, los métodos de contrainsurgencia que han sido utilizados hoy. Y a nivel pura y simplemente táctico, esos, esos métodos han funcionado a las mil maravillas, pues este, este, esta persona fue parte de la unidad que desarrolló esos métodos. Es decir... Estamos hablando desde apoyo aéreo cercano para unidades pequeñas, infiltración, eh, sobre todo modificaciones express, o sea, expresas en el equipo, modificación de uniformes, modificación de correajes, los famosos Magpul. Los famosos Magpul los crearon esta gente simplemente poniendo una cuerda de paracor y cinta eh, alrededor del cargador para poder sacarlos rápidamente de las cartucheras que tenían. De hecho, estas personas tenían que llevar una cantidad ingente de munición en sus misiones porque se enfrentaban a fuerzas 10, 20, hasta 100 veces superior en número. O sea, eran equipos de 6 a 10 personas y se metían en zonas dominadas por el enemigo donde el enemigo solía tener una presencia superior a 1.000 hombres fácilmente. O, a, o, o, o sea, tropas de más de 1.000, en algunos casos... Por ejemplo, un caso muy concreto, se encontraron en medio de tres divisiones del, del, vietnamita, del ejército norvietnamita y eran seis. O sea, para que os hagáis una idea de cuál era el tipo de, de perfil de misión, por supuesto lo único que podían hacer era salir corriendo, tuvieron la suerte de conseguirlo y contarlo, menos mal, contárnoslo a nosotros. Y en este sentido, pues creo que es un vídeo muy interesante porque no hablo yo. Habla fundamentalmente él. De hecho, si tengo que pedir disculpas primero por dos cosas. La primera porque al haberlo hecho en el PC... No sé por qué el, mi PC no consiguió encontrar el, el micro. 
y entonces se me oye bastante mal. Lo voy a intentar arreglar, lo vais a ver en el vídeo lo que es la edición, voy a intentar arreglarlo lo más posible y limpiarlo lo más posible, pero se me va a oír mal. Pero yo no soy importante, lo importante es él y por fortuna a él se le oye estupendamente. Entonces, eh, sin más dilación, os dejo con él, con John Stryker Meyer. Como yo digo, pondré toda la documentación relevante a su persona y por qué es importante y por qué lo quiero en el canal y porque ha sido un absoluto honor tenerlo. Y os dejo con, con la exposición que hizo sobre sus vivencias en Vietnam. Y bueno, espero que disfrutéis este vídeo. El, por supuesto, el vídeo tiene un inconveniente y es que eh, al ser este, esta persona es norteamericana, no habla español y entonces el vídeo está subtitulado. Entonces, pues yo entiendo que mis vídeos, la mayoría de vosotros me habéis dicho que lo veis como podcast, esto os puede resultar un poco más difícil si no domináis el idioma. De todos modos, he hecho, hago el esfuerzo y vosotros sois los que, vaya, los que van a, lo vais a dirigir eh, vais a decidir si vale la pena o no. Y sin más dilación, os dejo con él. Sure. Good morning, Miguel. Thank you for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Uh, name is John Meyer. Um, in 1966, after flunking out of college, the Vietnam War was going on full speed. Uh, America was drafting uh, men and women to serve in the country's military. And uh, I read the book, The Green Berets. And the Green Berets, uh, at that time, and they still are, in my opinion, the elite force in America for special operations, where they are trained to work with indigenous people from their country to help to improve their living conditions, to, to defend themselves against tyranny. And the motto of the Green Berets is to free the oppressed. The I'm oppressed sorry, liberal. The yes, sir. I know sir. the motto. I know the motto. Yes. Uh, okay. <laughs> It's uh, one of a kind. It's not like we came, we we came to conquer, no, to free the oppressed. And uh, really proud of that model. And uh, so in my case, I enlisted in the army, went through basic training and advanced infantry, jump school, special forces training for seven months. And then we had a little bit more training later for radio teletype, went to Vietnam. And after our in-country training as Green Berets, That there was a uh, mission that they had a couple of special projects going on. And the guy comes out, hey, we're looking for volunteers. And uh, Johnny McIntyre, my buddy, goes, for what, Sarge? He said, can't say. Either you're in or you're not. And so we put our hands up. And this is May 1968. The Vietnam War had been going on for, in the public eye, for over four years. <clears throat> And at that time, we had a secret war across the fence in Laos and Cambodia and North Vietnam, where we had no Americans stationed. Yeah, because But, uh, this is for the audience. Uh, yes, of course. There was no official. There was no official recognition of any troops outside Vietnam until the 1970, maybe until Kissinger authorized further action into Laos and Cambodia. Well, that was, was the. They had the incursion into Cambodia, which was May 1970. Yeah. And that yeah, was so, about five or six years too late. And then later they had Operation Lamson yeah. up in Laos, which was disastrous because they waited so long to try to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Had they done that in the early part of the war, I believe it would have been a different outcome in the war. Yeah, because uh, you had, well, actually your method of, Your, your method of uh, operating there it was actually against all odds. I've checked with veterans of GWA, the more recent, the recent wars, and your mission profile was short of, wasn't, was short of suicide mission. Uh, deep reconnaissance, <laughs> completely surrounded by thousands of enemies that knew perfectly the, the terrain they were moving in. Being discovered, it's just being botched. You, you had to run. I've, I've read your book and others. And it, I, I find this miraculous that you're here today to tell the tale because uh, I know I would have died like a thousand times. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, so, uh, yeah. I'm here today only by the grace of the Lord. Let's be clear about that. Um, I was very fortunate. And what we learned after the war, many years later, was that uh, Mac B. Sog, which was the secret war across the fence in Laos and Cambodia, went on for eight years, but we assigned papers saying we wouldn't talk about it for 20 years. Yes, I read about that. I read about so, that because you say it in your, you say it in across the fence in the prologue, I believe. I'm talking about the top of my head, but it's, it's been a while since I read it. I just took a few notes for this interview, 
later on, but yeah, I, I believe he's actually 20 years without saying a word. How different were things then than, than, it's, than they are now? But the book right. about the death of Bin Laden was about six months after he was out on the left on, on, on the bookstore and he actually waited 20 years to say anything about it. It's incredible. Right. And, uh, and so what we learned many years later was that uh, Sog had the highest casualty rate in the war. It was basically exceeded the 100% casualty. So your, your question is, how do you exceed 100% casualty? Well, it's killed in action, wounded in action, and missing in action. So in the yeah. category of uh, the wounded in action, we've had men like uh, Bob Howard, who served for three or four tours. He had he was put in for 11 Purple Hearts. A Purple Heart's an award you received when you're wounded in combat. I have one. Bob. That's what I, want to say. That's what I was going to say. That I, I know you have one. I have two Bronze Stars with Valor Device. Yes, sir. So, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, this man's a hero. Okay. Well, I wouldn't say that, but I'm, I'm definitely a, a fortunate survivor of the Secret War. Yes, sir. <laughs> Well, the 100 casualty rate, I can understand because uh, that person who wasn't, wasn't killed outright, I believe you had a 3% in casualties. That three, you lost about 100 people. I, I, don't and the, yours. I don't know what the total numbers were, Miguel, but here's the other side. I mean, today, as you and I are talking, uh, there are still 1,579 Americans in Southeast Asia who participated in the Vietnam War. That are still listed as missing in action. That's for Vietnam, mm -hmm. Cambodia, Laos. There's a couple in China, a couple in Thailand from aircraft that crashed. I know you're, you're making a research to find the remains and relocate them back home. Well, to our the government US. is allegedly working on it, but it's not a top priority in my opinion. But that's another yeah. story for another day. Yeah. Um, but out of that, 50 Green Berets are still missing in action, listed listed officially as missing in action. From the secret war, and they're in Laos and Cambodia the remains, and their families never knew the truth about their valor, where they died, or how they died. They're immediately told your yeah. service member died in combat in Vietnam. So they even yeah. lied about where they died, because they died in yeah. Cambodia or Laos or North Vietnam. A well, training accident. It is, and it's part of the as yeah. uh, the uh, downside of a secret war. But the families that have lost their siblings never yeah. learned the truth until many years later. And many parents mm -hmm. and even siblings go to the grave without knowing the true nature of the missions that their sibling was on as a Green Beret. And we also had 83 aviators who died. 83. Listed as missing in that. We documented up to 83. There's probably more who died in SOG missions. Yes, sir. Then Kobe, Kobe, Kobe covered for you. Um, or uh, uh, aircraft like the uh, Phantom Jets, A-1 Sky Raiders, the helicopter gunships, the helicopter crews that came in to pick us up. Yeah. Those were piloted by RBN, by RBN pilots. Uh, well, we had we had both. We had many um, American units like the 101st, the muskets from the Marical Division, the 176, First Cav, mm -hmm. and yes, in 68, the primary uh, transport for SOG teams was the South Vietnamese Air Force, the 219 Squadron, mm -hmm. which had heroic, fearless pilots that saved our teams time after time. We'd they be went surrounded. Down those HA-34s, which yes, were sir, the power. Yes, sir. I, I know those helicopters because my father's a naval officer. He retired as an 05. And oh, that right? was a pilot. was a pilot. And we had those helicopters back in the late... I actually knew them when I was a child, about in late seventies, early, very early eighties. It was when they were retired, and I know those those birds. And actually, years later, when I realized where they were coming from and what they did in Vietnam, I was astonished that you know I was I was saw those uh, like clumsy flying, you know, those heavy heavy helicopters. And you did some. They they actually performed incredible things. Just like they came back home riddling bullets and still flying. It was impressive. It was impressive. Oh, yes, Both sir. pilots I mean, have brass balls, just like you did. Just like you did. <laughs> I mean, I'm here today thanks to the heroism and the courage of those Vietnamese pilots from the 219th and the other American aviators. We had 
a wide a, a wide selection who supported us and in each case whenever we asked for help they came mm -hmm. All right. Uh, yes, uh, I have known some some stories about them. Some of them were roughed up. Let's say, let's leave it at that. Roughed up by the the NBA when they conquered when they actually conquered the country. You refer in your country that some of them were captured and they had a bit, a bit of rough time. In the they did. Could they communists when Saigon fell April thirtieth, nineteen seventy five? That was the official. Yes day when uh nva troops entered saigon yeah and uh after promising never to invade south vietnam they did of course because they're communists and they lie <laughs> like yeah. the communists are in in uh, around the world today you can never yeah. believe anything they say yeah. and uh but on that, that day like when it fell several of the king bee pilots were captured yeah and they were forced to go to re-education camps so men who saved our team um yeah. Captain Tuong, uh, then Captain Tin, uh, uh, several others, Duong. These are just fearless men. And the Americans, many Green Berets from those SOG missions and our, our, our indigenous troops were, were alive and lived after the war, thanks to their heroism. But they were put in re-education camps. Some mm -hmm. were there for as long as 13 and a half years. 13 years? Yeah, Captain so Tin went in. And his family thought he was dead. They never heard from him. He finally escaped, somehow came back to America and was able to get reunited with his family. But uh, that's, quite, that's quite an incredible feat. But, you know, I don't find it any, I don't find it strange. You just uh, wrote, you just wrote in, on the ground and, and across the fence. What did these guys do and how steady they were under heavy fire coming from all sides and they came and down and picked you up and just... They took you home and then went to your their families that very night. You know, it, it was only Tuesday, it, like uh, like it was nothing. And and the following day they were again and again they were doing that. And uh, something that is not very well known and I learned actually from your books is that it was very hard for you to find an actual place to land because right. you, you had to to uh, to prepare several LC, LCs at the same time. Because, you know, you, they could be waiting for you at any time. In a couple of occasions, you referred, you, you weren't even able to land on any of them because all of them were under under surveillance by, by the NVA and they were waiting for you on any of them. So it was incredible to come back the next day and try again. Yes, sir. Well, they, they want us to get on the ground to find out what the mm -hmm. enemy was up to and... Uh... That was our charge was to try to get in and um you know it was a relentless battle ongoing for sure yeah and another thing that something that actually uh we well all of the the people most of the people who are going to see this video and actually the guy that is friendly comes we're our players okay we're our players and actually when we knew that um uh, that uh a dlc was coming and you were involved in it. That's all the words I needed to buy the thing. So oh, we actually, yeah, that's all. That. So yeah, Jim Strickenmeyer is involved in it. Uh, he's so, he speaks in a mission. They say, don't, don't say anything. Don't say anything more. I'm buying <laughs> it. I'm already downloading it and installing it. And yeah, it was one of the Aspire commissions. You tap comms. You actually tap, uh, tap the comms across the, car, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. You went down, you, you wired up those communication lines. And I want to know, because I think it's a piece of neat technology for the 60s. How did you put that things on the ground that the, the CIA and the intelligence services used to, used to monitor traffic, mostly heavy yeah, they, traffic tracks and that? What did you what did you use? What, they, what, what were the seismographs, microphones? There, are, there were sensors that, sensors, that picked yeah. up uh, uh, movement. So they have yeah. a... They had different units, but the ones that we inserted had a central unit, then had coaxial cables that went out, and they were all placed along the trail so that anything that went by, whether it was an animal, a person, truck, tank, whatever, it would register it and then send uh, information to the Air Force that would come by. Yeah, but they had to send, you have to filter in all the noise from the background noise, animal noise, 
even, you know, I've been not in Vietnam, but I've been in the jungle for a couple of months on a humanitarian missions back in, back in the 80s. I was still a teenager when my father was in charge of one such missions in Africa. And you know how uh, people don't, normally don't know how noisy the jungle is. <laughs> So right. how did they, how did they, because they didn't have the computers they have now, how did they sift through all that? Well, again, this is technology that's above my pay grade. Our job was to put them in. We were told okay. they worked. And in each oh, case, um, that was that gave them another uh, source of intelligence. Again, I'm not sure how, how useful it was or how long they remained in place. And they had other devices that they dropped in the jungle near trails from the aircraft. Yeah. that hung in the trees monitoring the trails. And again, how effective? Uh, we have to find an Air Force guy that was in charge of monitoring <laughs> yeah. that. <laughs> so, Our yeah, job yeah. was to get in and to make sure that they were working when we left. And well, then we got in there. I, I think, think that's, that's more research, research for me to do. <laughs> anyway, well, good luck with that, Miguel. <laughs> Anyways, so, so let's, let's, uh, let's talk about the, 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 the missions, missions and, and, you know, you know. I believe, I believe, and again, talking about the top of my head, that uh, Green Berets were founded in what, in 61, 62? And you uh, entered 60... 52, they were officially formed. 52. So yes, they were. So we have formed... those, are, those are called the SF Special Forces Originals. Yeah. And they were formed under Colonel Aaron Bank and other officers because the Cold War was, was cranking up in, in Europe. Yeah. And we wanted special forces to work there and elsewhere in the world so the originals and there's a couple that are still alive they're in their 90s today those were the first green berets that went to europe for the cold war and to other theaters and as time went on uh by 1965 we had the first special forces group that was in okinawa and they were in charge of asia the 10th special forces group was in charge of europe the fifth special forces group had Vietnam, and those were the uh, the three main active groups in the seventh special forces group. And the first has sent people, small teams, TDY to Vietnam before the fifth group was in place. And the seventh group was in charge of South America, Central America. But they also, because the war just needed manpower, like the 20 year war we just completed, yeah. every special forces group no matter where they were assigned, they wound up sending teams to Afghanistan or Iraq as yeah. part of that ongoing uh, effort for all those years. Yeah. And so in 65, those other units were the primary one. Then you had the third special forces group that did Africa. That, and they're okay, there that, today. Sorry, I just wanted to comment. Uh, the shield on your polo shirt is the common, uh, Command and Control North. You were yes, in Command and Control North your first tour, I recall? They might well, before uh, I first landed at FOB one at Fubai, and in, mm -hmm. in, in May of '68, there were six uh, Ford operating bases, FOB mm -hmm. one through six, different parts mm -hmm. of the country. We all ran missions yeah. across the fence. In '69, they consolidated the six into three. CCN was north of Da Nang, CCC was Kantum down two core, and then uh, CCS was down in three core for missions into Cambodia. And, mm -hmm. and that war went on, and that effort went on until 1972. Like I said, the eight year secret war went from 64 until 1972. So 1972, so well, well, in, well, actually, when when the American troops started, stopped uh, uh, actually making the offensive war fell together. So there, I believe the, the withdrawal, I believe the withdrawal, military withdrawal was in 1973, maybe, and they actually Correct. took a year and a half for North Vietnam to. To reach Saigon and you know across the entire country. Well, and, they had, uh, in 1972 they had the Easter Offensive in April of 72, mm -hmm. and that effort was thwarted because they were going. They were hoping to push all the way through, but the South Vietnamese were there and they still had TAC Air, and we had some Green Beret teams that were doing missions that haven't been written about yet. That um, thwarted yeah. that effort by the North Vietnamese. So it took yeah. them three years to lick their wounds. And then um, when we pulled out our troops, uh, we had agreed to remain with TAC Air to support the South Vietnamese government. And then, of course, Congress, uh, that was dominated by Democrats at the time, ruled mm -hmm. against funding anything further in Vietnam. 
So there's no yeah. funding to support DOD to keep our word that we had given to the South Vietnamese. And so they fell April 30, yeah. 1975. Yeah, they, fought to the, they actually fought to the last man. Because, you know, yes, and there, comparing, and there's comparing always... with the Afghans that actually took a week for the Taliban to control the entire country, like two weeks uh, it took, they held on their own for a year and a half. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good comparison because the RBN has been poorly treated by historians. They are they are always portrayed to be a corrupt organization, pretty much useless. And I know this is not the case. I know they there were there were corrupt elements, but they were very good men fighting for the RBN. And I believe it, the, the history has been very unfair to those men. Well, there yeah there there is the I mean. Every, each unit had its heroes and those who wouldn't fight. And uh, they they had some outstanding troops. Uh, the Viet, my, my team was all South Vietnamese. I'm alive today, mm-hmm. thanks to their valor. And of course, to the uh, a- aviation people that pulled us out. Yeah, They were I just know. fearless. They hated communism. They would rather live in a country, South Vietnam, mm-hmm. that was corrupt, that they knew, than to live mm-hmm. under the thumb of communism. Yeah, that's just their basic fact. They were willing to die for that. Yeah, people forget that. Was, that. Those were very little brave men. They're incredible because I'm going to derive the conversation towards the part that actually, as an arsenal player, or an actor, actually, um, I want to portray the most because I am interested in every aspect of the Vietnam War. Don't get me wrong, but I have to keep these uh, video in focus. So, apart from these people, they were actually small frame people who were very wiry, very muscular. You were actually lanky, tall American. That most of you, because you were, you were compared to them, were lanky, very tall. You know, like giants for them. But these people actually weighed at about 150 pounds and carried 110 pounds of gear. Well, very quick. <laughs> the, so yeah, uh, some of our Vietnamese were were maybe weighed less than that, but yeah. uh, they 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 carried their fair share of weight. I'm not sure about the actual weight because. The Americans carried 90 to 100 pounds. And the South Vietnamese would carry a little bit less because of their frame of their body. Most most of it ammunition, by the way. (laughs) A lot of ammunition, yes, sir. Most of it ammunition. uh, If they weighed 120 pounds, I always said 50 pounds was their size of their heart, their fearless nature. Yeah, pretty much. Absolutely. They were awesome people. They were actually awesome people. They were not... You know, they were not faced by anything. You know, it's just like we're surrounded by 30,000 troops. That, that, that happened once. One we're time, surrounded by 30, we barely, troops. our six man team, we were just lucky to get out alive. So <laughs> they started short fusing claimers, which were, they started running. They started short fusing claimers. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to actually do a better recall of this. They started putting claimers just like we do in Arma, actually. Short fight, short sure. And then they were actually stepping on mines. And they said they are very close, very close. Then we were actually, uh, you know, thirty seconds to one minute of advantage, and then they, no, in they, this they, case, they might, they might the mission mm-hmm. you're talking about, for me at least, was yeah. uh, Thanksgiving Day, 1968. And the yeah. mission was to find three NVA divisions. We walked into a base camp, where later on they figured that one division was walking in and one had just marched out. Yeah, and and the point and the tail of us each heard us they came at us hundreds of them all divisions you had claymores and at one point we put down claymores with five second fuses as part of our escape and evasion to get back to the lz then we worked gunship a helicopter gunships from the 20th air force 20th special operations squadron they made the gun runs between our weapons and the claymores we were able to get back to the lz uh quickly enough that they were able to pull us out before we got overrun. You yeah, you actually were with a six-man team total? On that mission, it was a six-man. Yes, sir, myself, Bubba Shore. Six, it was 30,000. Well, well they, were trying to, they were trying to catch us, but uh, we lucked out on that day, Miguel, believe me. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Uh, it's, it's it's incredible. It's, it's actually incredible that someone actually thought of it, pull it off. I, I just have a, a question for you. Did you attend Recondo School? Say again. Did you attend Recondo? Recondo school. The Recondo uh, school. We had in-country training when we yeah. came into Vietnam, and I yeah. think I forget they called it Recondo school. What the what the title was? But it was a three-week program. Yeah. We came in. We went through weapons. 
how to use TAC Air, how to work with the local people, and other training, you know, uh, medical training for combat wounds and things like that. Mm -hmm. And later they had a 1-0 school that was formed in uh, the summer of 1968 to train future 1-0s. And it's put together by combat veterans who served on recon teams like Tra Lieutenant Travis Mills. And he had a team that put together the school. And then they saved many lives because they were able to train a uh, men to go into recon. Yeah, yeah, I believe it was pretty realistic. Uh, right, recently actually, the, the, the training was pretty realistic in there. Well, that included were, a mission. They would actually run a mission. A, a mission, yes. That's that's yes, what most people call the you know, famous recon school. We are recon guys actually running training for people who were actually going to do those missions and came out and actually come out on top, which is something I'm not talking about for, to a civilian like me, but. Uh, you know, uh, I want you to uh, to talk uh, to talk about that because you uh, the Green Berets were what sixteen years in the making, mm, fifteen years in the making, and you actually I th always thought that at that time special operations special forces were on the bad side of big army of conventional army, and you have to scrunch a lot of weapons and so you have to use a lot of material that it was. Basically, what did what they didn't want, all you could get a hold of, and that is well the Okinawa Department. That was the CI, the CISO office come in, yes, and uh, I just wanted to know uh, because I don't know if the they made things based off your feedback or they proposed things and you say, hey, try oh, no. this. They the gentleman who was in charge of that office uh, who came to Vietnam. He had, during the course of the war, he came and talked to Green Berets over 88 times, at least 88 times. Okay. So in the early parts of the war, he came in and learned that they didn't have proper rations. So he designed a ration for the indigenous troops. That would be rice, fish heads, mm -hmm. a different kind of uh, uh, delicacies that they could use for a meal that they could put together while they're on the move. And he added vitamins to that yeah. supplement. So when they ate the meal, they they didn't know that they were also getting uh, uh, vitamins and health foods put into their rations. So this is Ben Baker who designed that. He was the head man. He came to our country, get, and we always had experimental weapons, clothing needs, because everybody, they look at now, they look at the Green Berets of Vietnam that wore, wore tiger stripes. Well, in our case, we had some of the material was too thin. Others were too thick. So when you got wet, it would it would take a long time to dry out and you could get crotch rot or something like that. So we never wore them in missions across the fence. We were uh, conventional. Apart from these missions that you're wearing, actually, uh, Tiger Stripes, all of those, all of the photos you posted, all of the photos I've seen of you, actually, you're wearing the uh, third pattern of gender uniform? Just a conventional, what we call jungle fatigues. Yeah, jungle fatigues. Yeah, third yes, partner. Sir. I believe it's a third partner for the the the, the, four, the, uh, the way the uh, the way the pockets, the way the breast pockets were sewn. I believe it's right. The, they had four pockets, and then we and we had two that were sewn in here. Yeah, and one each on each shoulder. We could put yeah. uh, different like mer uh, our mirrors. The you more have threats. you had a, uh, actually super super pockets for your syringes for your morphine syringes. I believe I read that. You had your you have your one you have your yours customized. Yes, sir. Yeah, we went. To, we had a local tailor, went to him, and he gave us the pockets. And there was well designed, and we that's the way we do. Put the maps in, the signal mm -hmm. mirrors, and and any other things that we didn't want to lose. Yeah, because it's incredible. Because now those sort of th those things are commercials. Are commercial now, and be on you know on combat uniforms and all that. But these people actually tested the concept. They invented it. You invented right. a lot of things, just like the the pole, just like the Mac poles using parkour and using parkour and and, uh, and duct tape. And uh, now they're commercial. Now they they're made of plastic or rubber or something. And you tested it fifty years ago. You were already doing these things. It's it's amazing. Yeah, I mean Ben Baker put. I I can't even tell you how many different times he came to the country always looking for ways to improve what we needed. <clears throat> in the early days, mm -hmm. any weapons we wanted, he could get them. Mm -hmm. And whereas, like you said, 
the conventional army didn't, you know, we they they didn't like working with us, except when they needed the Green Berets to go out and get intel for them. But uh, there was always that friction between special forces, that branch of the army, and yeah. then the regular conventional army. Yeah. But we were able so to It's not a myth. So this is not a myth. This is uh, this actually happened. Oh, well, it's a fact. Yes, sir. Yeah. There, there's other stories we could go into more details, but not today. Well, uh, I've just received a notice that we're ten minutes, uh, ten minutes out of the of the, the, the meeting. Uh, if that happens, it's actually short. So I will send you another. And I will link and we'll retake it from there. So okay. I knew this was going to take long because I, couldn't, I just can't, I cannot help myself. I've been into the Vietnam War 30 years now because I started in the 80s when the, when the, the country made amends with the veterans, with the Vietnam veterans that were so mistreated during the 70s. And they were doing pictures and they were, they were actually getting into mainstream media. They got their story told. And, you know, I got all those friends. And when I was a teenager, I got, I got all, all the friends. Say, and, I inter- and I was interested in the history. And I started at 16, maybe. That was that is more than this, almost 35 years now. So, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, I've been waiting a long time for this. Quite a, yeah. So, uh, well. Thank you. Well, this is, uh, well, uh, uh, again, again, uh, this, you say something is, is going to be very controversial for some people. You were using a CAR-15, it was in XM 177, I believe it's an one or a two. I, I can recall the, the name, the, the model from the top of my head. You said it never failed you. Say again? So you said your rifle, the CAR-15. Right, the CAR-15 was never, nice. never failed you. Right. Which is we... something that is not the common, not the common knowledge for the Vietnam War. I believe it's more myth than reality that had some reliability issues. But you say you use that more than for probably anybody. The, the, the recon teams use the car, their user carbines fire more than anybody. But and you didn't have any issues with this. Can you tell I us? I didn't personally. A few, uh, mm-hmm. one or two men did. But don't you're talking about the M16 in the early days? Yeah. There are yeah, severe 64, problems. 64, 65, yeah. Right, with the with the ammunition. And again, it was mm-hmm. a purchasing agencies in the government. The people who designed the M16 recommended a certain type of gun pattern. Mm-hmm. And then the military came in and through the contract and got a different gun pattern for the rounds, which resulted in the dysfunction. And it took a while to get that squared away. And we lost, tragically, we lost men who died with their M16 malfunctioning. But they approved it. I had an M16 that I ran over uh, 5,000 rounds through. I never cleaned it once. It never malfunctioned. Wow. And then for our for our missions, we carried, like you said, the CAR-15, which was a variation with a collapsible stock, a shorter uh, barrel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we there was twice where I went through every bullet. We were down to the left. And I always carried 600-plus rounds. Yes, 618 made a, I make calculations because you say you carry at least 30 to 34 magazines, which is absolute, an absolute, an absolute freaking big combat load. Then right. hand grenades, small grenades, CS gas, uh, the wind beats. And the M79 and then, rounds. Yeah, yeah, 40 millimeter right. rounds. Then we always carry the so, gas so, mask. Well, you were walking astronauts. Yeah, M17. I'm actually trying to get a whole one of those. <laughs> you know, they're harder to come by. <laughs> so I'm yes, trying sir. to get one of it, one of those because uh, I got to tell you because uh, there's several people that we want to do a, a recon and actually a RT Idaho 1968 impression, which is your team, and of course um, I'm reminding you basically your web gear and the 1937 BAR belts with the, the M66 uh, suspenders and all. Yes, and uh, I believe it's genius. I believe that it's genius because you can carry a lot of rounds on you very actually, very comfortably. Very comfortably for the time. It's, it's, it's impressive. <laughs> now, all, right. put that, all that kit on you and you say, hey, I can actually walk with this thing. <laughs> I was amazed. Yeah, we, we moved a little bit slower when we carried the full load. Yes, sir. But uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's a little bit slower. What what about actually one of the missions you portray in the Arma that you'll see? You actually uh, camp for the night, and you refer that in your books. You actually you you didn't for, you didn't fight at night because you didn't have that 
you got some maybe some you know so very early starlight uh starlight, no we didn't uh, we didn't carry when we were on missions we did not carry the starlight scope because that was the first night vision device night vision device mounted but it was too on heavy to carry for our missions across the fence we used it when we were in country for local ambushes we told the villagers to stay off the trails anybody walked down the trail we soon was the uh, communist and then yeah. we would engage them but uh on our missions across the fence we never carried the starlight so at night we had a usually a circular defensive perimeter so that each man would be within a hand's reach of everybody and jungle triple canopy at night is dark you can't see your hand in front of your face i know and we had no night vision at the time that we carried with us so that was um so no, technological, night, so no technological edge over the nba or the vietnam correct. okay they were superior numbers and you didn't carry a technological edge and let that sink they, in let that sink in right and so and they if they tracked us they would try to hit a team first thing in the morning. So we were always up before first light. Our team was always on full alert in the event that they ever tried that, but they didn't. And uh, our tactics uh, pre precludes you, that. We were very You fortunate. stop every half an hour or every 40 minutes to listen for 10 minutes? Maybe we would move just... for 10 and move 10 when we moved in the jungle while we're moving towards an objective. Sometimes we might move longer but it would depend on the density, how much enemy activity there was, and the, you know just what we were running into on the ground in terms of jungle vegetation. How good were NBA trackers, in your opinion? Some were very good. And they by uh, 1968, they had a battalion, which is 3,000 men, designed and trained to hunt track down SOG recon teams uh, and they were designed with... they were told to kill the Americans but to leave the indigenous alive well let's go straight to the questions I got a few actually that my friends have sent me for you to for you to answer as briefly as we can so first thing is one of favorite of ours uh, we were actors which is the uh, the wrist breaker the M79 uh, shorty Sure, the arena launcher that you carried alongside others, and it was your hand cam. Uh, did you get to use it? I believe you did. Oh, yeah. I mean, there on, on that mission that day, that was one of those times when I was out of ammo by the time we got to the LZ. Oh, and there are other yeah. times when there was a, twice when I went through, I, I remember at least two missions where when we got pulled out, I was down to my last magazine. And when okay. I was down to the last magazine, I either had one more round or out of M79 and out of hand grenades, except right. for the last one that I carried up here. How, how many 40 millimeter, one millimeter grenades did you carry? About what, uh, 15? Uh, maybe 10 to 12. Okay. And then we always had a CS uh, round, the yeah. tear gas. Tear gas, yeah. Course, That's uh, why you carry the mask. You're mm -hmm. right. We would pop that in an emergency to disorient the enemy. Okay. We always carried gas masks ourselves. Okay. Uh, who actually who uh, who took out your your uh, your weapons? Because I've seen car 15s with the extra, uh, you know, with the extra handle on on the handguard, which is something that is not replicated just now. That was later on, and some people had those things added. And then, uh, like Lynn Black, he put the uh, an XM 148 grenade launcher yeah. underneath his. Yeah. He liked it. I didn't like to carry it in the jungle because it would get mm. hung up on the jungle too much. Mm. And I liked yeah. my little thumper. Another uh, another member of your team actually carried the uh, famous China Lake. One, so these. The famous, what? Uh, the, pump, the, the China Lake, the pump action grenade launcher. Oh, I, I know it was a prototype. Mission, but it was too heavy. And, and the ammunition, you had to be a really extra strong guy to carry all the ammo for it. Okay. But we did. I mean, it had great firepower. You could fire four or five rounds, yeah. like with a shotgun. And the version we had, you just fired, pumped another round in, and we uh, were aware of total. Power. Sorry, were you, were you aware of the total uh, casualty rate uh, you were suffering at the time, or no. was it was something you realized? Okay, you realized later. We, we learned later about the hundred uh, percent mm -hmm. casualty rate long after the war was over 
We knew okay. it was bad. We knew we lost a lot of men. When I arrived at Fubai in May of 68, we had several teams that had been literally wiped out. Another team, everybody was killed except for the one zero who escaped and evaded. And he was, he had just got back into camp. So we, uh, mm -hmm. we heard about his story. So we knew that the North Vietnamese army, the Congress were putting extreme efforts against our teams on the ground in Laos and Cambodia. Okay. Uh, some members of the teams, just like uh, Eldon Bartwell, which I believe he actually got uh, all the way up to Major General. Correct. And, he was uh, almost 40 he, years in the Army altogether. Yeah, yeah. he got, uh, he actually brought back to the U.S. You know, the famous Qigong that actually got shot on it. And actually he was mad because they ruined it and it was very hard to find one that it wasn't shot up already. <laughs> uh, and he brought that back. Uh, he brought that back home. Did you bring something... Did you bring something like a piece of clothes or something? Or well, yeah, we I had clothing and jackets and stuff like that, but nothing, nothing sexy like what Eldon brought home. <laughs> oh, I believe it's sexy because you know you actually carry it. You, you actually you, you want to send something. You, you want to send something. You want to actually discard something. You know you got a like a queue of people who actually want to have it. <laughs> if you actually want to to discard something that you brought. Okay, uh, another thing. How many times did you recall uh, you thought you were not going to make it? And so this is it. You were actually under fire at the time. You didn't know if you were going to be picked up. I knew you were wounded and hanging from a rope from a helicopter. And that's where you actually, when you lost your uh, M79 with your, uh, with your custom... Yeah, all my you know, gear, all I passed holster. out. I passed out and landed in the jungle and the helicopter landed and uh, Henry King came out and took off all my gear and threw me in the helicopter, but didn't go back for my, uh, for, for my for gear. gear. I, was just, yeah. I was just happy to be alive. <laughs> yeah. But there was a custom, there was a custom, uh, a custom holster for the M79 that would be, uh, that would be actually worth a fortune today. So that, oh, I know. Was, it was yeah, great. Uh, it was perfect. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, apart from that, um, you were wounded at least once, which was when you actually were hanging from in your, you were treated uh, on top of the mountain you just referred. Uh, how many times you had uh, that you, close calls you had every day, but uh, what were the closest calls you remember? Well, you just went through a couple of them. I mean, and I never, I never really thought that uh, I was worried enough that I was going to die at that moment. I mean, that's the thought pattern is just a different thought pattern. But we were dedicated, so focused on fighting the enemy that we were up against, that we're focused on the mission and didn't take a minute to say, oh, I'm going to, I'm worried about that. No, it's like, let's fight these bastards until, until we're, we're out of here. Well, it's when we put it because you went for another tour. I know you finished your 68 and 69, and then you went back to the U.S. and then returned for uh, 69, 70, when you yes, were sir. a radio 1-0. Because yes, sir. in your first tour, you were a radio operator. We were 1-2, uh, uh, maybe? 1-2. That's why I one, started, two. but yeah. by October of 68, I was the 1-0 for Idaho all the way through to April of 69. Then Lynn Black took over the team. When mm -hmm. I came back in October... Lynn and I ran a couple of missions together. He was the one zero. Then I was the one zero. Then he left. He got a promotion. And I mm -hmm. stayed with Idaho until the end, which was April 1970. April 1970. Well, this, yes, is a mission. this is an incredible mission you did in force. Uh, uh, on, on 1970, actually, you were in force there. You were in force to the Ho Chi Minh, actually trying to capture an NBA, NBA headquarters and try to find intelligence about the about their route and something. You, that is the Sock Chronicles, volume one. And that is my question. Will we see a volume two any, any day? Right now it's here. And for, for those who can't hear, I'm rattling my head. It's here. I hope right. to start writing, uh, hopefully as early as next month, to do uh, Saw Chronicles, volume two. That That's is actually great news to hear. Well, I just have to get off my dead ass and get to going. Well, I, I think that this is this day and point. This is not going to be a problem for you. 
I will wait for it. Patiently. Thank you, sir. <laughs> I will patiently work for it. And by the, the first minute you actually uh, get it into an electronic, uh, you know, Amazon or something. I don't know what you're working for now. That's what uh, we do now. Everything's available on Amazon. Okay, perfect. Perfect. And you did something with those guys at Peter Factor. Uh, I believe one of the volumes. I just got it from Amazon, by the way. I haven't gone through it already. And you, you have part of this. And this is actually stories from several teams on SOG. And, you got, and you're part of it, I believe. And what was that again? The beginning, I'm sorry. Peter, yeah, Picker Factor. Uh, stories from my, for my piece of, uh, I just got it from Amazon. Let me check. Oh, the Pucker uh, Factor? Yeah, the Pucker Factor. Uh, I just said, uh, I just got your name on it and uh, mine. <laughs> so I just bought it. Okay. I just saw you, John Stryker, Mayor. Okay. Okay. Don't, okay. It's mine. Oh, you're too uh, fine. Just this morning. Just this morning. So I didn't, I didn't. Yeah, uh, I, I work with Jason and, uh, He's he's doing his own thing with the pucker factor, getting stories in from the men from SOG, and I appreciate what he's doing. So I've been able to back him up a little bit. I haven't we we we're talking about doing a few more things with him. Again, it's just a question of time. Great he's news free, again. And then I'm free, so we can sit down and get it done, do it the right way. Perfect. Okay, I think we're actually running out of time, so I prefer to finish this uh, to the for today. Yes, Thank you so much for doing this for a humble Spaniard. Okay, on the other on the other side of the pond, it's been a blast. This man, this hour or so has been a blast for me. It's actually great to hear this from a legend like you. Uh, okay. We, are, I hope uh, to see, and I actually hope to see all those projects you have. Uh, you know, uh, get. To, I got a blog regarding. I got a blog uh, speaking about this. I, I've actually translated a. Look, an excerpt of one of your books just to put some things into context. Uh, I guess I will have to speak to the editor because I would love to translate those books into Spanish. I will get to you sometime in the future. To do well, that's like you that. and me, Miguel. Uh, I'm always happy to do it. And um, my both of my daughters, uh, actually all three of my girls have been to Spain at different times. They love your country. They mm -hmm. love your people. My sister visited there with her husband. She fell in love with Barcelona. And again, the wonderful people there. And there's a great history of Spain and the people and its culture that is rich. And uh, I would love to get it translated to Spanish somehow. I'm just not quite sure how we pulled it off. My oldest girl speaks Spanish. So she speaks Spanish and Italian. So maybe something just, we could work out an angle yeah it works work, work on an angle just to get uh here uh actually an editor that actually can put that in and release it in spanish i can i do translation for a living i'm a pro so okay. i can i can take care of it because i have all the source material very good and then the other thing is to direct people to my website which is www.sogchronicles.com I will put it on the a link in the description on the YouTube video when I finish editing this. Very okay. good. And we that on my website you'll see my interviews for Sogcast where I'm interviewing Sog veterans. Yeah. And you also Her. see I had eight interviews with Jocko Willink, who's one of our he's a premier an veteran. incredible, an incredible man. Amazing man. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Well, thank so, you again. Uh, and uh I look forward to talking to you later. And yeah. if we come we'll back, do another, we'll follow up some we'll day another the sir. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. And well, thank, thank you for, you for your time, service, Miguel, because you, you prepared for the interview. It makes it, a, makes it a better interview. I appreciate that. Perfect. Okay. We'll see you on a later time. And well, I'll edit the video. I'll actually make a master and upload it private. So you, you're going to you're gonna give it the okay. No, and then you, 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 know, you just go ahead and print it. I trust you. Okay. Okay. Perfect. No need to do that. Perfect. Okay, Wes. Well, well, I have when I have the video set up and edit, and edited with all the material I have, I have to put to actually to portray this and put images in place and things and all the links to your web page, your books, and all I have. Remember, to, all I need to do. Here's my here's my extra model on the side between friends, with your skill, your talent, and your money. We can go places, Miguel. 
<laughs> That's perfect. Okay. <laughs> that is good. Okay. Thank you. Have a good weekend, sir. Same to you, and we'll talk later. Thank Take you. Take care. Very God much bless. Again. Bueno, esto ha sido todo. Eh, esperemos que sea solo un primer contacto. Eh, se me han quedado cosas en el tintero, que lo típico de no tener, digamos, el papel delante, sino tenerlo que mirarlo eh, de manera esquilada. Me he dejado, de esquinada me he dejado unas cuantas cosas. Además, eh, la entrevista se ha tenido que cortar pronto porque este hombre tenía otras cosas mejores que hacer. Normal. Así que... Eh, en este sentido, pues habrá más. Espero que habrá. Ya estoy hablando con él para un... Bueno, no, no va a ser pronto, va a ser cuando se pueda. Además, eh, procuraré que la próxima vez, pues tener los medios mejor preparados. Un reto para mí, por supuesto. Y sobre todo disponer de más tiempo para poder hacerle más preguntas y aprender más con él. Deciros simplemente eso. Básicamente yo llevo... Esperando, he hablado con otros veteranos de Vietnam en persona en Estados Unidos, pero es diferente. Ellos han estado en unidades regulares, ellos realmente estuvieron a lo mejor un año o dos años. Y en ese año o dos años, siendo, unidades, siendo miembros de unidades de artillería, infantería, etcétera, etcétera, pues veían bastante menos combate que este hombre. Siendo parte de, parte de las operaciones especiales, él iba de patrulla, iba de misión todos los días prácticamente. O varias veces a la semana al menos, con un descanso, creo que descansaban a lo mejor dos o tres días a la semana y tres o cuatro días se lo pasaban en la jungla día tras día. Una de las, por ejemplo, una de las operaciones que refiero en el vídeo, como habéis visto, en los, es el Día de Acción de Gracias de 1968, que es un festivo muy importante para los americanos y ellos estaban allí dando leña, igual que también tuvieron ofensivas en Navidad, ofensivas de Pascua, etcétera, etcétera. O sea, que, que digamos que fueron, no es lo mismo pasarse un año en una unidad que está constantemente en primera línea, que en una unidad que rota, una unidad que rota un tiempo en primera línea y otro tiempo pues, está en retaguardia, como por ejemplo lleva pasando en todas las guerras convencionales, al menos desde la Primera Guerra mundial. Entonces pues espero que eh, os haya gustado al menos, solo al menos, eh, os haya gustado ver el vídeo la mitad de lo que a mí me ha gustado hacerlo. Yo podría pasarme hablando con este hombre horas y este hombre además no, eh, so, eh, no, solamente, no, me ha, no solamente no me ha bloqueado <risa> después de haber hecho todas las entrevistas sino que además haremos más. O sea que si os ha gustado esto, esto es un poco la punta del iceberg. Intentaré hablar también con un compañero suyo eh, con un compañero suyo de, que es el señor Lynn Black, que no he hablado con él hasta ahora, he leído sus libros, pero no he hablado con él hasta ahora, a ver, a ver las redes qué es lo que nos permiten. Y en definitiva, pues espero que esto sea, esto va a ser una lista aparte de Gear para Dummies, ya que es un poco mucho más historia y está centrado en recreación, recordemos. Gear para Dummies no es un blog de recreación, lo único que pasa es que no voy a crear otro canal para recreación, por dos motivos. Primero, es... Demasi es todavía más nicho que el Airsoft y todavía tendría un público aún más reducido del que tengo. Y por otro lado, yo soy una persona que soy un jugador de Airsoft que está haciendo sus primeros intentonas de recreación. Me falta mucho tiempo, mucho que estudiar y tomar mucho zumo sol para considerarme un recreador. Así que solamente estoy haciendo unos intentos de equipos de recreación que las estoy haciendo con el mayor tesón del que soy capaz, es lo único que puedo decir a mi favor. Luego vosotros seréis, cuando ya salgan, seréis ya los jueces de si realmente parecen lo que pretenden o no. O realmente son lo que pretenden o no. Eso ya lo voy a dejar a vuestro libre albedrío. Pero bueno, como digo, si os ha gustado el vídeo, espero que haya más de este tipo, porque personalmente no hay nadie que te cuente... Nadie te va a contar mejor la historia de algo que utilizaron o de cómo lo utilizaron o cuáles eran los motivos para utilizarlo que las personas que lo, cuyas vidas dependían de usarlo. Bueno, y aquí lo dejo, espero que os haya gustado, es un vídeo que vuelve a la, a la duración antigua. Personalmente, si hubiera sido por mí y un poquito por él, porque le encanta hablar de estas cosas, menos mal, suerte para mí, eh, este vídeo podría haber durado tranquilamente. De haber podido los dos, creo que podría haber durado también entre tres o cuatro horas y ser con mucho, con mucha diferencia, el más ameno de todos los que he sacado en el canal. Bueno, pues muchas gracias a todos y muy buenos días.